as I said, the mostly life-size mice and animal sculptures by Johann Gottlieb Kirchner and Johann Joachim Kendler are undoubtedly among the highlights and visitor favorites of the Dresden Porcelain Collection. Commissioned by Augustus the Strong in 1730 and made exclusively for the Royal Collection, this porcelain menagerie cannot be experienced in this abundance and density anywhere else, despite later sales, exchanges and losses. Here alone, we can gain a visual idea of how visitors to the Augustan Porcelain Palace on the other bank of the River L, the Japanese Palace, were once to experience the installation of hundreds of these animal sculptures. Ultimately, the interiors of the Japanese palace were never completed after the death of Augustus the Strong in 1733, and so there are no pictorial sources for the originally planned presentation of the porcelain animals. What you see here is a fantasy of the American interior designer Peter Marino and his vision of exoticizing baroque opulence. What still amazes today about Kendler's mice and animal figures in the is the natural liveliness that characterizes them. In my lecture today, I would like to show how Kendler achieved this effect and the perception and understanding of animals behind it. I would like to compare Kendler's sculptures with representations of animals in French art of the 17th and 18th centuries, not because they directly influenced Kendler, but the comparison shows the extent to which his conception of animals and their artistic depiction was clearly in keeping with the zeitgeist and embedded in the virulent discourses of the time on the relationship between man and animal. But first, I would like to briefly summarize the background of the Augustan order and point out the special features of Kendler's animal figures in comparison to those of his colleague Kirchner. Augustus the Strong commissioned the Meisen manufactory to create a porcelain menagerie when the plans of his porcelain palace took a decisive turn in 1730. Convinced that Saxon porcelain had finally surpassed East Asian porcelain, he reserved the entire upper floor of the Japanese palace solely for mice and products. The triumph of mice and porcelain is foreshad uh, foreshadowed in the tympanum of the entrance facade, on which an Asian and a Saxon delegation offer porcelain gifts to Saxonia enthroned in the center, one submissively, the other victoriously, with her foot on the first step to the throne. Just below the tympanum is the gallery which Augustus the Strong dedicated to the animal menagerie as part of the redesign of his porcelain palace. Visitors should first familiarize themselves with the full variety and outstanding quality of the Chinese and Japanese porcelain on a tour of the lower floor, only to be surprised and amazed at what the Saxon genius was able to create from this foreign material when they enter the gallery with the monumental animal figures on the upper floor. According to the Meisen painter Hörold, the Japanese palace showed that the Indians were unable to mold such large pieces from their porcelain mass, as there was nothing comparable in the royal collection. His words confirm that the technological competition with East Asian imports was an important impetus for the creation of the monumental Meissen animal sculptures. The animal figures also stood out from the other Meissen porcelain ordered for the Japanese palace, mainly vases and tableware with decorations inspired by East Asian models, not only as technological marvels, but also for the decidedly European character. Heard in their pride, it was the main argument of the Europeans that although the Chinese had a very good command of porcelain technology and some experience in designing tea sets in their designs, their designs were generally irregular and clumsy. In other words, they did not conform to the European maxims of correct representation of space and bodies in terms of perspective and physiognomy. 
It was here that Augustus the Strong recognized his royal manufactory's most important advantage. Once it had mastered the technology, it was the first and only manufacturer that could give the foreign material this, the shape and appearance that suited the taste of the European clientele. It was precisely this innovative potential of Saxon porcelain that the animal sculptures were intended to highlight in the overall context of the Japanese palace. The effort to achieve a naturalistic effect in the Meissen animal figures in comparison with the more schematic Asian models can be seen by comparing one of Kendler's first models, a seated osprey, with the older direct copies of Japanese porcelain eagles. Although Kendler's osprey does not yet have the agility of his later birds, there is a fundamental difference in that he rests the belly on a tree stump to support it during firing, allowing the bird's legs to be molded naturally slender. The drawing of the plumage, which reveals the outline shaft and vein of each feather, also makes his eagles more lifelike than the Ch Japanese examples. One way of breathing life into the animal figures and making them appear animated is to show them in characteristic activity. This was certainly Kendler's intention when he created another model of an osprey devouring a curb in the same year. Even if the neck is elongated and the posture appears still a bit stiff, this already shows Kendler's striving for liveliness and naturalness, which set him apart from Kirchner. It is somewhat unfair to show you Kirchner's elephant and rhinoceros, both of which were designed in the same year as Kendler's osprey. For while it can be assumed that Kendler had already been able to observe eagles, Kirchner could not have seen an elephant and rhinoceros with his own eyes. He had to rely entirely on graphic sources. This copper plate engraving by Abraham de Bruin, kept in the Meissen archive, must have served as a model for the for Kirchner's rhinoceros. He transformed it into a three-dimensional figure, which nevertheless remains entirely focused on the side view and appears immobile. Unlike Kendler, however, Kirchner's animal figures did not turn out more naturalistic and animated by the fact that he had the opportunity to observe living specimens. He actually has modeled Bozzetti of leopards, a lynx, and a tiger while in Dresden. It can be assumed that he had visited the so called lion house there, where all of these species mentioned were demonstrably kept at the time. However, the physiognomy of the big cats in Kirchner's porcelain figures is not correct. Even contemporaries were unsure whether the tiger was more likely to be a lion. Although the protruding canines, canin, canines are atypical for both. Lynxes, on the other hand, are more delicate with hairy ears and a protruding stumpy tail. Porcelain cats resemble each other more than their living counterparts, especially in their human-like facial expressions. The oversized eyes with indicated pupils and upturned ears lend the animal figures a certain liveliness and presence despite their motionless postures. Lions also lived in Dresden at a time and must have been known to Kirchner from personal experience. These two marvelous Meissen models from 1732 can be attributed to him. Although there's no doubt about the identity of the animals, it is clear that Kirchner was hardly interested in capturing the essence of these animals of prey. Rather, he presents the lion and lioness as the king and queen of the animals, and thrown before us in a lofty and aloof manner, looking down upon us. Human characteristics and behaviors are attributed to them, which are expressed in their postures and almost caricatured, exaggerated faces. In comparison, consider Kendler species and fighting with a boar. Both species were kept in the animal enclosures of the Royal Hunting Lodge Moritzburg. 
A wiesent, a European bison, is always referred to as an aurochs in the records. Although this wild cattle species was already extinct. Increasing colonization forced the wiesent also to retreat and they were only found in East Russia and Poland where Augustus the Strong had access to them. Auroxes were legendary for their strength and were therefore often used in animal fights where they were pitted against bears, wolves and boars. Henter chose such a battle scene for his model, even though he had certainly not experienced such a fight during his studies in Moritz's book. The composition of the animals fetched into each other, a motif that has been handed down since antiquity, could go back to a graphic source. It captures the climax of the fight, which still seems undecided. The bull has pinned the white boar between his, its front legs and is pushing it to the ground while the boar bites its front leg. The depiction of the wiesent, which is far smaller than life size, makes the fight appear balanced and heightens the drama of the scene. The depiction of the battle situation alone, which gives the viewer the illusion of a before and after and thus appears animated, emphasizes a categorical difference to Kirchner's animal figures. Details such as the curly hair of the bison also testify to Kentler's precise observation of nature in comparison to Kirchner. The examples cited show how different the mice and animal figures are in their degree of naturalism and stylization. But what did Augustus the Strong want them to look like in order to demonstrate the pioneering technical and artistic mastery of the material compared to the East Asian imports? The documents provide only a few clues. There are order lists that show that the mice and artists must have had certain liberties as they supply, supplied animals that were not ordered, such as the Oriole and Jay, while others, such as the porcupine or camel, were ne unfortunately never executed. A report by the traveler Johann Georg Kaiser suggests that Augustus the Strong wanted the animals to be as lifelike as possible. During his visit to the Japanese palace in 1730, the king's latest plans were described to him in detail. Heisler reported on the animal figures that had just been commissioned, stating that both native and foreign birds and animals were to be made of pure porcelain and in their natural size and color. The art and beauty of, this first uh, of the first examples could not be admired enough. His words echo the idea of mimesis, that is the imitation of nature by artistic means which goes back to antiquity. Painting of each animal after its kind, as requested by Augustus the Strong, was intended to further enhance the natural effect, whereby unlike in the case of this rhinoceros, much of the white of the porcelain was to remain visible in each animal. There should be no doubt at all as to its materiality. The fact that most mice and animals are monochrome white, uh, monochrome white today is due to the fact that most of the large models were not subjected to additional color firing and were therefore painted with oils. Over the centuries, this unfired color has become dirty, darkened and rubbed off, which is why it was often removed completely. However, many of the animal figures in the porcelain collection still show traces of oil paint. The example of this seated monkey with grapes shows how the exact, uh, accentuated coloring of the faces and limbs could enhance the natural, lively effect of the animal figures. It seems to me to be closer to the king's intention than the monkey painted all over in the Rex Museum in Amsterdam. The opaque, dark color conceals the animal's posture and the finely carved structure of its fur. A further indication of Augustus the Strong's endeavor to obtain the most naturalistic animal figures possible from Meissen 
is the fact that Kirchner and Kendler were to study living specimens rather than relying solely on graphic sources, as was the prevailing practice in mice. Here I show you two of Kendler's king vultures. The first model is certainly based on an illustration. The second, however, was created after Kendler had seen a live specimen in Moritzburg. Kendler first traveled to Moritzburg for one day in 1731 and then to Dresden for a further three days to draw the recent as well as Indian birds by virtue of high orders. In 1734, Kendler spent a further two days in Moritzburg and almost the whole of July in Dresden to make bozzetti and drawings of animals in the lion and bear house, but also of stuffed specimens in the animal gallery of the Zwinger, so that they could be modeled all the more naturally and beautifully in Meissen. So the more natural, the more beautiful. On his second visit to Moritzburg, Kentler encountered also griffin vultures. In an unusually detailed work report, he describes how one of these imposing birds of prey had the entrails of a betten cockatoo in its beak, being about to devour it. Kentler's words reveal his fascination with the brutal natural spectacle he witnessed. In his porcelain snapshot, the drama is vividly reenacted for the viewer, as recalled in Johann Christian Müller's memoir of a visit he made to Dresden in 1744. I quote, I can remember a bird of prey with a mauled hen lying in front of it, its blood bespattered body and innards clearly visible, all as natural as if it was living. And even if his memory did deceive him into the uh, thinking that the figure was painted even though it was in fact white, this testifies all the more eloquently to the piece's dynamic and emotional effectiveness as a work of art. Even Kendler's contemporaries noted the extraordinarily natural and lively appearance of his animal figures. Jonas Hanway emphasized in his travel report from 1754 that the bird and animal figures produced in Meisen were also natural that, I quote, I could not conceive of any superior idea in this respect. Hanway's compliment was all the heavier as he dismissed the Royal Porcelain Collection as a whole, as a vanity of unnecessary variety and a profusion of expensive baubles. Only the animal figures seem to him to have artistic merit. Well, to summarize briefly, Augustus de Strom ordered the monumental mice and animals exclusively for the royal collection in the Japanese palace. They were intended to demonstrate the technological and artistic superiority of the first European porcelain compared to the East Asian porcelains assembled there. Firstly, through the unrivaled size and complexity of the sculptural models, and secondly, through the decidedly European art of mimesis, the imitation of nature using, using artistic means. It was precisely the natural effect of the animals as if they were living, that was praised by contemporaries and even emphasized as unique, even if it didn't apply to all models equally. How unique were the mice and animal figures really? And what artistic means did Kendler use to achieve the famed natural lively effect? In fact, there are only a few large scale animal sculptures, sculptures with which the mice and figures can be compared. Most of them come from multi figure fountains. This also applies to the only other ensemble of the Baroque period that Augustus the Strong must have known from personal experience, the more than 300 colorfully painted lead animal figures of Louis XIV's maze in the palace gardens of Versailles. Created by many different sculptors, they were intended for uh, 39 fountains illustrating animal fables. They were to teach viewers a lesson, verbalized in short poems. 
It is true that the animal figures in, the Vers in Versailles show a certain naturalism and are based on the artist's own studies or on drawings of live animals in the nearby royal menagerie. However, the aim was not to depict the animals as independent beings. Rather, they were meant to symbolize conflicting human characteristics and had an anthropomorphic character. The artists were not free in terms from either uh, of, uh, as the animals were intended to spout water as fountains and elaborate arches. Although Kendler could not have seen the Versailles animal figures himself, I would like to contrast his cockerel with a fighting pose by Etienne Le Hongre with his growing cockerel to show the differences in the two sculptors' conception of animals. Both were certainly based on observations of nature, although the pose of Kendler's cockerel seems more natural, as confirmed by my internet research. A significant difference lies in the faces, while Le Uncle's cockerel, with its beady eyes and chubby cheeks, takes on human features. Kendler's is clearly an animal head, despite the ornamental treat, treat, treatment of the plumage and the schematic rendering of the eyes. Above all, however, Kendler succeeds in breathing dynamism and movement into the exciting stretched cockerel by emphasizing the opposing curves of the feathers on its tail, wings, neck, and head. The cockerel is the protagonist, not a projection surface. It is a characteristic being in its own right that defies the simple attribution of human traits. We have seen that Kantler developed his respectful and empathic, empathetic view of, of animals from his study of nature. Unfortunately, none of his sketches in Buzzetti have survived. The example of Peter Bowell, however, shows how the opportunity to observe a wide variety of animals at close range led to a revolutionary new form of artistic representation. Standing in the Flemish tradition of naturalistic still life, Spohl was commissioned by the French court to produce paintings of various animals as designs for tapestries for the Gobelin manufacturing. Many of his preparatory sketches, which he made in the Royal Menagerie in Versailles, have been preserved. In this sketch, for example, Bowell attempts to quickly draw the various body parts of a lynx that is constantly moving before his eyes. Bowell is excellent at capturing the animal's vit vitality in its characteristic movements. These interest him rather than the anatomical structures and mechanisms of the animal's body, which were at the center of the natural history illustrations of the time. In this oil study on canvas created in the studio, Bowl also combines different views of the fox and characteristic body parts, which together bring the animal vividly before our eyes. The same applies to Bowl's studies of macaws. The, the one uh, shown here combines four of these large, colorful parrots in, in rear, side, three quarter and front views. The two birds facing the viewer appear to be engaged in conversation. Even more dynamic is a second study with three views of one and the same bird balancing on a branch in different postures, its long tail balancing the weight of its outstretched body. The impression of precarious equilibrium is heightened by the bold asymmetrical composition as a whole which is directed towards the upper left corner. Handler also captures just such a balancing act in his monumental figure of a macaw climbing downwards. It is quite typical for macaws to dangle upside down from branches. The backward tilt of the head in particular indicates that Handler must have been observing a live specimen. Nevertheless, his figure is not a cast of a bird's body, but a very carefully composed sculpture that suggests tension and movement through its posture. 
the bird assumes a contrapost, a contrapost posture with his feet glowing at different heights. As a result, one side is slightly compressed, which is further emphasized by the rotation of the head, while the wing of the other side is pushed upwards to compensate. This posture gives the macaw inattention. At the same time, the wingtips support the long tail. It is not only the bird that has to keep in balance, but also the porcelain figure during the firing process. The example of Bowl shows how two generations before Kendler, the direct encounter with living animals by an equally open-minded and talented artist led to strikingly lifelike, excitingly animated depictions of animals, albeit in a completely different medium, which served as a preparatory work and was not yet considered as an autonomous work of art. In the executed tapestries, the animals of the Versailles menagerie appear comparatively frozen and de-individualized as royal luxury objects, just like the silver gilt vase, the richly embroidered textiles, and the marble columns of the stately architecture. Both sketches and studies inspired subsequent generations of painters from Desport, who was the first animal painter to be admitted to the Royal Academy in 1699, to Audrey and Bacalier. From the Royal Menagerie in Versailles, a French school of animal painting developed that reached its full bloom in the mid-18th century. French animal painting was characterized by a new way of looking at non-human creatures, which countless sculptures also invite us to do. As an example, I would like to cite Audrey's contemporary painting of a trapped wolf, which allows us to empathize with the pain, terror, and despair of the injured animal. We involuntarily shudder at the sight of the broken front leg from which the bone protrudes, not unlike a human arm. Above all, however, the head thrown back, the mouth wide open in an agonized scream, the glistening, piercing eye and the erect ears and neck hair give the animal's suffering an expression that is immediately comprehensible to our sensitive ears. Udry's painting impressively demonstrates that animals are living beings with sensory perceptions, feelings, consciousness, and the ability to express themselves, which differ from humans only in degree, but not fundamentally. Audrey skillfully uses Baroque stylistic devices to arouse our sympathy for the fate of the wolf. The lifelike depiction of the body contorted in pain and the dramatic lighting are reminiscent of martyr depictions of the time. Kendler did not have such painterly means at his disposal, but the shiny surface of the porcelain allows for a play of light and shadow which he skillfully used to enhance the lively effect of his animal figures and to direct the viewer's gaze. In this greyhound, for example, the ribs that the bulldog has bitten into can be seen beneath the top skin, as well as the veins on the forehead of the straining animal. The bare teeth, wrinkled nose and staring eyes are also an expression of pain though perhaps a shade less dramatic than in Udry's wolf. However, Kendler's animal figures are also independent creatures that touch us emotionally because we can understand their feelings and the instincts they, that drive them. The Meissen Menagerie shows the characteristic behavior and inner motivation of the animals in their entire range, from the fighting dog and the vulture devouring its prey, to the protective she-wolf and the caring mother goat. Kendler's animals remain animals and are not mere illustrations of human characteristics. Yet, they are sentient beings like humans. They perceive their environment with their senses and react to it, 
like Kantler's wolf or Utri's setter, which turn their heads in the direction of the perceived sound, smell, or movement. Their depiction with pricked ears, wide open eyes, and flared nostrils emphasizes precisely the sensuality of the animals. The depictions of animals by Kentler and Utri reflect a debate about the nature of animals that was violent at the time. Without written evidence, it is notoriously difficult to link visual artists with philosophical positions. However, there is evidence that these wide-ranging discourse, discourses contributed significantly to the growing popularity of the animal motif in the visual arts. Parallels between the controversial questions about the nature of animals and the innovative pictorial representation by Kendler, Woodry, and other artists cannot be dismissed out of hand. The debate flared up in the last third of the 17th century over the question of whether or not animals had souls. This question had profound religious implications. Had the creator endowed humans with an immortal, immaterial soul that made them fundamentally different from animals? But if so, what moved and motivated animals? Descartes had spoken of animal machines of a purely mechanistic drive without feelings or consciousness. This was vehemently contradicted in the Parisian salons. Without going into the details of the complex disputes, I would like to emphasize that this question became a central sticking point in the decades long bitterly fought contest between philosophical schools. The example of Lieselot of the Palatinate, who lived at the court of Versailles, shows how widely the issues, issue was discussed. In a letter of 1702 to her aunt Sophie of Hanover, she summarized the debate for herself as follows, I quote, that made me think of Mr. Leibniz. He maintains, you say, that animals have intelligence, that they are not machines, as Descartes claims, and that their souls are immortal. So in the next world, I will have the joy of seeing not only my family and friends, but also all of my animals. But I would be really surprised if that meant that my soul was mortal like theirs and that altogether it'd be nothing. I prefer to stick to the other opinion. It's much more comforting. So in the early 18th century, such unresolvable metaphysical speculations were more and more eclipsed by empirical scientific research, which could not avoid recognizing a certain intelligence in animals. Scientific observations placed on an ever broader basis increasingly led to the implicit realization that the difference between humans and animals was not a qualitative, qualitative one, but only a gradual one even if those who formulated this too aggressively had to reckon with censorship and banishment. As with artists, it was those naturalists who observed living animals very closely, attributing to them the ability to perceive and feel as well as to react consciously, such as avoiding pain. They found the, that animals learn from experience, adapt to new situations, and even communicate and interact with each other. The controversy over the animal soul and research into animal physiology, behavior, and psychology led to a new understanding of animal nature, which is also reflected in contemporary works by visual artists. One of the main problems from an artistic point of view was to make the animals appear exciting and animated as their inner movement also speaks from their outer appearance. Wendler still amazes us today with his ability to simulate sensitive life that can still touch us. Finally, I would like to raise the question of why Augustus de Strong commissioned a menagerie for the Japanese palace and what message he might have intended to convey 
with the predominantly life-size animal figures in the context of the Japanese palace. In Louis XIV's shadowy dark Versailles maze, the animal figures consistently embodied negative human traits, combined with the implicit message that only the absolute sovereign can contain and discipline man's bestial nature. In contrast, the mice and figures intended for the light-flooded gallery of the Japanese palace show a wide range of animal behavior and intrinsic motivations, from the struggle for survival to the nurturing and rearing of offspring. Although the animals remain animals and are not humanized, the viewer involuntarily relates their nature to his own by recognizing similarities between animal instincts and his own. Animals continue to be perceived in relation to humans. The explosive nature of the virulent de uh, debates lay precisely in the recurring question of the extent to which humans differ from animals. In this respect, the mice and menagerie of tame and wild, domestic and exotic, weak and strong animals can be understood as a reflection of courtly society, which was at the service of Augustus the Strong or was controlled and dominated by him. But there are also other levels of meaning, I think. The sensational thing about the mice and animal, animals was their materiality. A central motif for the order of the, uh, was the technological and artistic competition with East Asian porcelain. The naturalistic reproduction of the animals expressly requested by the king was intended to demonstrate European superiority in the artistic design of the material. The fact that the animal sculptures were intended to demonstrate Saxon superiority in porcelain production emphasizes the act of artistic design, which seems to bring the material to life. Porcelain itself is the result of a chemical endeavor, endeavors to transform one material into another in fire, giving it a special aura. Alchemy was characterized not only by the idea of transforming matter, but also by the conviction that a life force, or pneuma, burns in every material substance. So to conclude, in the complex discussions about the animal soul, alchemical processes were compared to the original of animal life. The emergence of their soul was compared to the extraction of gold from lead. The mice and animal sculptures are a manifestation of the miracle of transformation that Augustus the Strong had achieved through the reinvention of porcelain and which was further enhanced in the artistic creatures, the skillful artificial simulation of life, which vividly demonstrated the superiority over the, so to speak, spiritless East Asian rites. Well, I thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoyed the lecture.